Hi, friends. I'm Annie F. Downs. Let's read the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the stories of Jesus Christ's life on earth, the friendships, the parables, the sacrifices, the meals, the miracles. Each month we read all four books, so make sure you subscribe today so you don't miss any of it. And if you get a chance to rate and review the show, that would mean a lot. So here's how it works. I'm going to read three chapters to you today. You can listen or read along in your own Bible, and then I'll pray, and that's it. Today is April 20. Fourth, day 24, and I'll be reading Matthew chapters 10 through 12. And this month I'm reading from the message. Matthew 10. The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. This is the list of the 12 he sent. Simon, they called him Peter or Rock. Andrew, his brother, James, Zebedee's son, John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax man, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who later turned on him. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. And all you need to keep that going is three meals a day. Travel light. When you enter a town or village, don't insist on staying in a luxury inn. Get a modest place with some modest people and be content there until you leave. When you knock on a door, be courteous in your greeting. If they welcome you, be gentle in your conversation. If they don't welcome you, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. You can be sure that on Judgment Day, they'll be mighty sorry, but it's no concern of yours now. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. You're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack, so don't call attention to yourselves. Be as shrewd as a snake, inoffensive as a dove. Don't be naive. Some people will question your motives. Others will smear your reputation just because you believe in me. Don't be upset when they haul you before the civil authorities. Without knowing it, they've done you and me a favor, given you a platform for preaching the kingdom news. And don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The spirit of your father will supply the words. When people realize it is the living God you are presenting and not some idol that makes them feel good— They're going to turn on you, even people in your own family. There is a great irony here, proclaiming so much love, experiencing so much hate. But don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it in the end. It is not success you are after in such times, but survival. Be survivors. Before you've run out of options, the Son of Man will have arrived. A student doesn't get a better desk than her teacher. A laborer doesn't make more money than his boss. Be content, pleased even, when you, my students, my harvest hands, get the same treatment I get. If they call me the master, dung face, what can the workers expect? Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open, and everyone will know how things really are, so don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body, and soul in his hands. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? Don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. 
We are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me, the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my Father who sent me. Accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. Accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone help. This is a large work I've called you into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. Matthew 11. When Jesus finished placing this charge before his 12 disciples, he went on to teach and preach in their villages. John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison. When he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his own disciples to ask, Are you the one we've been expecting, or are we still waiting? Jesus told them, Go back and tell John what's going on. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. Is this what you are expecting? Then count yourselves most blessed. When John's disciples left to report, Jesus started talking to the crowd about John. What did you expect when you went out to see him in the wild? A weekend camper? Hardly. What then? A sheik in silk pajamas? Not in the wilderness, not by a long shot. What then? A prophet? That's right, a prophet. Probably the best prophet you'll ever hear. He is the prophet that Malachi announced when he wrote, I'm sending my prophet ahead of you to make the road smooth for you. Let me tell you what's going on here. No one in history surpasses John the baptizer, but in the kingdom he prepared for you, the lowliest person is ahead of him. For a long time now, people have tried to force themselves into God's kingdom. But if you read the books of the prophets and God's law closely, you will see them culminate in John, teaming up with him and preparing the way for the Messiah of the kingdom. Looked at in this way, John is the Elijah you've all been expecting to arrive and introduce the Messiah. Are you listening to me? Really listening? How can I account for this generation? The people have been like spoiled children whining to their parents. We wanted to skip rope and you were always too tired. We wanted to talk, but you were always too busy. John came fasting, and they called him crazy. I came feasting, and they call me a boozer, a friend of the misfits. Opinion polls don't count for much, do they? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Next, Jesus unleashed on the cities where he had worked the hardest, but whose people had responded the least, shrugging their shoulders and going their own way. Doom to you, Chorazin. Doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had seen half of the powerful miracles you have seen, they would have been on their knees in a minute. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. And Capernaum, with all your peacock strutting, you are going to end up in the abyss. If the people of Sodom had had your chances, the city would still be around. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Matthew 12. One Sabbath, Jesus was strolling with his disciples through a field of ripe grain. Hungry, the disciples were pulling off the heads of grain and munching on them. Some Pharisees reported them to Jesus. Your disciples are breaking the Sabbath rules. Jesus said, really? Did you ever read what David and his companions did when they were hungry? How they entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar, bread that no one but the priests were allowed to eat? And didn't you ever read in God's law that priests carrying out their temple duties break Sabbath rules all the time and it's not held against them? There is far more at stake here than religion. If you had any idea what this scripture meant, I prefer a flexible heart to an inflexible ritual. You wouldn't be nitpicking like this. The Son of Man is no yes man to the Sabbath. He's in charge. When Jesus left the field, he entered their meeting place. There was a man there with a crippled hand. 
They said to Jesus, Is it legal to heal on the Sabbath? They were baiting him. He replied, Is there a person here who, finding one of your lambs fallen into a ravine, wouldn't, even though it was a Sabbath, pull it out? Surely kindness to people is as legal as kindness to animals. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. He held it out, and it was healed. The Pharisees walked out furious, sputtering about how they were going to ruin Jesus. Jesus, knowing they were out to get him, moved on. A lot of people followed him, and he healed them all. He also cautioned them to keep it quiet, following guidelines set down by Isaiah. Look well at my handpicked servant. I love him so much. Take such delight in him. I've placed my spirit on him. He'll decree justice to the nations. But he won't yell, won't raise his voice. There'll be no commotion in the streets. He won't walk over anyone's feelings, won't push you into a corner. Before you know it, his justice will triumph. The mere sound of his name will signal hope, even among far-off unbelievers. Next to a poor demon-afflicted wretch, both blind and deaf were set down before him. Next, a poor demon-afflicted wretch, both blind and deaf, was set down before him. Jesus healed him, gave him his sight and hearing. The people who saw it were impressed. This has to be the son of David. But the Pharisees, when they heard the report, were cynical. Black magic, they said, some devil trick he's pulled from his sleeve. Jesus confronted their slander. A judge who gives opposite verdicts on the same person cancels himself out. A family that's in a constant squabble disintegrates. If Satan banishes Satan, is there any Satan left? If you're slinging devil mud at me, calling me a devil, kicking out devils, doesn't the same mud stick to your own exorcists? But if it's by God's power that I am sending the evil spirits packing, then God's kingdom is here for sure. How in the world do you think it's possible in broad daylight to enter the house of an awake, able-bodied man and walk off with his possessions unless you tie him up first? Tie him up, though, and you can clean him out. This is war, and there is no neutral ground. If you're not on my side, you're the enemy. If you're not helping, you're making things worse. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you deliberately persist in your slanders against God's Spirit, you are repudiating the very one who forgives. If you reject the Son of Man out of some misunderstanding, the Holy Spirit can forgive you. But when you reject the Holy Spirit, you're sawing off the branch on which you're sitting, severing by your own perversity all connection with the one who forgives. If you grow a healthy tree, you'll pick healthy fruit. If you grow a diseased tree, you'll pick worm-eaten fruit. The fruit tells you about the tree. You have minds like a snake pit. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you're so foul-minded? It's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words season after season. An evil person is a blight on the orchard. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Later, a few religion scholars and Pharisees cornered him. Teacher, we want to see your credentials. Give us some hard evidence that God is in this. How about a miracle? Jesus said, you're looking for proof, but you're looking for the wrong kind. All you want is something to titillate your curiosity, satisfy your lust for miracles. The only proof you're going to get is what looks like the absence of proof. Jonah evidence. Like Jonah, three days and nights in the fish's belly, the Son of Man will be gone three days and nights in a deep grave. On Judgment Day, the Ninevites will stand up and give evidence that will condemn this generation, because when Jonah preached to them, they changed their lives. A far greater preacher than Jonah is here, and you squabble about proofs. On Judgment Day, the Queen of Sheba will come forward and bring evidence that will condemn this generation because she traveled from a far corner of the earth to listen to wise Solomon. Wisdom far greater than Solomon's is right in front of you, and you quibble over evidence. When a defiling evil spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis, some unsuspecting soul it can bedevil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person spotlessly clean but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. That person ends up far worse off than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. That's what this generation is like. 
You may think you have cleaned out the junk from your lives and gotten ready for God, but you weren't hospitable to my kingdom message. And now all the devils are moving back in. While he was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers showed up. They were outside trying to get a message to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are out here wanting to speak with you. Jesus didn't respond directly, but said, who do you think my mother and brothers are? He then stretched out his hand toward his disciples. Look closely. These are my mother and brothers. Obedience is thicker than blood. The person who obeys my heavenly father's will is my brother and sister and mother. That is Matthew 10 through 12 in the message. So let's pray. Jesus, we want to be obedient to you. We want to be called your family, called your friend, and obey what you ask us to do and follow what Scripture says, even where it says to to rest and to put all of our cares on you. We want to be obedient in that too. So show us how. Teach us how, Holy Spirit, we don't know how to do any of this without you teaching us. So would you teach us today? Would you teach us how to obey Jesus? We love you, Jesus. We love your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.